Interview season is upon us, so what better way is there to practice than with a mock MMI interview? In this video, we will introduce each station, then I'll leave a few seconds for you to pause and to think about how you would approach that station. Then I will give a model answer and we'll go through the mark scheme for that station. Before we get into it, for those who don't know me, my name is Rohan and I'm a fourth year medic studying at Cambridge University. Also stay tuned to the end of the video where I'll tell you about how you can get a mock interview with me if you want. Anyway, let's get going. This station tests your ability to prioritise. It's a fairly classic MMI question. You are newly elected CEO of the NHS responsible for a budget of £150 billion. How do you allocate funds for the running of the NHS? Here's my answer. £150 billion is a massive amount of money. So the first thing I would do is to undertake careful research into where the demand is greatest in the healthcare system and also try to evaluate which services are most effective and which ones need to be improved. From my prior knowledge, I would like to split my spending strategy into two parts, short-term implementation and long-term investment. So firstly, things to be implemented quickly. I think the NHS workforce is deserving of a pay rise and particularly those on the lower end of the income scale. This is because staff are the biggest asset to the NHS, but they've been under huge demand throughout the pandemic for such a long time. And even this summer, I read some articles saying that it was one of the busiest on record, so people have had very little respite. So increasing their pay will hopefully show that they are valued and will hopefully stop people leaving the profession or experiencing things like burnout for the feeling of not being valued enough. We also need to increase capacity ahead of this winter where we will experience waves in both COVID and flu infections. This could be done through vaccination drives for both flu and COVID, particularly in vulnerable age groups. And we could also plan to increase hospital capacity through the adoption of virtual wards, which I've seen was taken up during the pandemic, where patients can be monitored in real time from home rather than physically being present in the hospital. I would also like to set up treatment hubs to work through the backlog of elective surgery lists which have been growing in the pandemic. For long-term investment, the NHS would benefit from a new computer system which is standardised across this country. One issue I have observed in work experience was that not all data is shared between GP and hospital. So for example, GP only has access to blood results of patients done at the GP and not at the hospital and vice versa. This lack of communication will inevitably lead to less efficiency. So a new computer system which links these things together will hopefully reduce the administrative burden of the healthcare system. I would also invest more in community nurses and facilities to support vulnerable people in the community. This is particularly important as in the UK we have an aging population where people often have multiple chronic conditions and have complex needs. This will reduce the issue of bed blocking in hospitals where patients are medically fit for discharge but have nowhere to go because they need extra support to live at home. This will create more space in hospitals and reduce the risk to patients as they can acquire hospital acquired infections and become institutionalized if they stay too long in the hospital. So for this station there's no right answer and there are many ways you could approach this. Notice how because it is a big question I have signposted to show the interviewer where I am going. This is good because if you're running out of time, the interviewer could prompt you to move on to the second part of the answer. In this question, you would get points for showing you have insight into how the NHS works, some of the issues facing the NHS, and coming up with practical solutions. You would also get credits for explaining your reasoning logically. Red flags might be failing to come up with any potential solutions to the problems in the healthcare system, or just criticizing it without backing up what you're saying. I'm going to discuss how I would approach this question in an interview, and I think this will be helpful for you. The question is, a patient diagnosed with HIV reveals to their GP that they have not disclosed this information to their partner. Discuss the ethical issues involved. So this is a potentially tricky scenario which requires a sensitive approach. The key issue is confidentiality. Confidentiality applies to any information given by a patient to a healthcare professional in a clinical setting. And if the information is shared, it should be anonymized in such a way that the individual cannot be identified. Confidentiality is really important in maintaining trust in the doctor-patient relationship. So with ethics questions, it's always best to try start with the law at first if it's relevant to the question, and then take the four pillars of medical ethics in turn before coming to a conclusion. So for the law regarding confidentiality, there are quite a few laws and they wouldn't expect you to know them. The ones relevant to this case would be the NHS Act 2006, which says that you can use personal data if it's shared between those offering care directly to the individual involved. But 
it protects the patient confidentiality when you're using their data for other purposes not linked to their direct care. So for example, you can discuss patient identifiable information in an MDT meeting if you're all involved in their care, but you should anonymize that information if you're going to use it for something else like research. Also be aware that the Data Protection Act of 2018 or the GDPR, which you might have heard of, tells us how we're supposed to handle and store confidential information. Confidentiality may be challenged in cases such as infectious diseases because by not telling other contacts of the infected person, you may risk them becoming infected with a potentially life-threatening disease. So for certain diseases like TB, they're classed as a notifiable disease, meaning that clinicians have a statutory duty to notify local health authorities of suspected cases. And if you didn't know, HIV is a sexually transmitted infection, which if not treated will progress to AIDS, and this is where your immune system is basically destroyed and you're constantly on the risk at life-threatening infections. If infected patients are detected early, then they can be treated with antivirals to prevent the spread of infection, but this is not curative, so they're on this therapy for lifelong. So it turns out that HIV is not one of these notifiable infections, but don't worry, you wouldn't be expected to know this, and it's perfectly valid to ask the examiner any questions during the interview, if you're unsure. So if we were to run through the pillars of medical ethics, First, autonomy. The patient has a right to have their medical information kept confidential and has a right to choose who is able to access that information. However, this pillar may be challenged where there's risk to others in the society. So if you think about beneficence, which is acting in the patient's best interests, in this scenario, the individual patient presenting to the GP is not at direct risk. However, considering non-maleficence, the doctor has duty to guard against potential harm and this patient could cause harm to their partner if the partner is not notified by the HIV status, as this prevents them from taking certain precautionary measures. Justice is considering the interests of wider society. In this scenario, the society may benefit from the information being disclosed to the partner at risk, as this may prevent a local epidemic of HIV. And to round up with these types of questions, it's good to come to a conclusion, especially if you're asked to. So, in conclusion, the benefits of disclosing the information to the partner about the HIV status may outweigh the benefits of maintaining patient confidentiality. Thinking about this practically, if I was a GP in this scenario, I'd first tell the patient to tell their partner first, and if they fail to do this, you notify them that you'd have to break their confidentiality in this scenario to protect the partner from any harm or HIV infection. But this should really be done as a last resort, and every effort should be done for the patient themselves to tell their partner. For the mark scheme in this situation, you'd get marks for identifying that confidentiality is the main issue and saying why it is important, and making reference to any relevant laws. You'd also get points for considering each of the pillars of medical ethics in turn. A red flag would be like jumping straight to the conclusion and saying something like, of course, the patient should tell their partner, or confidentiality should be broken without systematically considering the arguments for and against keeping or breaking confidentiality with the pillars of medical ethics and also considering the law. This station is about your insight into a career into medicine. The first question is, what are the challenges of being a doctor? From what I've read about being a doctor, it's a hugely rewarding career. But with everything in life, it comes with its unique set of challenges. For example, when I read This Is Going To Hurt by Adam Kay, I learnt about the physical and mental toll that working long hours and night shifts had on him, and the stress of working under pressure. From talking to doctors in my work experience, I've learnt that a major challenge is dealing with situations where you are unable to deliver the best quality of care for the patient, due to factors out of one's control. This has been made apparent particularly in the COVID pandemic, where patients could not have their loved ones visit them during their stay, due to infection control protocols and people often had long delays in treatment due to hospitals operating at reduced capacity. I can see how this must have been challenging for doctors who go into the profession to help make their patients feel better, but are unable to do so due to the external factors. The second question is, how would you deal with these challenges of being a doctor? I think it's important to have good coping mechanisms to deal with the challenges of being a doctor, so that the profession does not become too overwhelming or all-consuming in one's life. Personally, I think that having interests outside of school has helped refresh me physically and mentally, which enables me to deal with the stress of exams. For example, I love playing chess, and when I play for my club, each game takes up to three hours. I'm really passionate about the game, and just focusing on the moves I have to play takes my mind completely off school for that period of time. 
It also gives me something to look forward to during the week. Another thing I have found really helpful so far is having a supportive family who understand the stresses which I'm going through. Talking through situations with them has allowed me to compartmentalize these issues to clear my mind. And I intend to continue these strategies as I head into higher studies and also if I'm successful in becoming a doctor. So for feedback on this section, notice how I give a little introduction to each answer before diving into it. Also, I stick to two points and I back them up with examples before linking it back to the question at the end. In terms of marks, you'd get points for identifying certain challenges of being a doctor, giving specific examples, and having a balanced approach to your answer, and linking your experiences with the question, and this is particularly relevant for the second question. A red flag would not be answering one of the questions or just listing off like points or challenges without reflection, or downplaying the challenges of being a doctor. Okay, our final station is data interpretation. On the screen, you should see two sets of data from two studies. The first question is to comment on the data below from the two studies. My answer is as follows. Okay, so both sets of data show a graph with variation in mean melatonin levels compared with the clock time on the x-axis. And they compared this between Huntington's disease patients or HD patients and controls, who I assume are age matched and healthy. Both sets of data also show a table which corresponds to the data on the graph. In both studies, melatonin levels are higher in the night, which suggests that melatonin may have something to do with light or sleep. Looking at the first study, the peak in melatonin levels seems to be higher in HD patients and occurs later compared to controls. So the peak was 76 peak grams per mil in HD patients and occurred around 5.30 a.m., whereas in controls it was 60 picograms per mil and occurs around 4.30 a.m. However, this is not reflected in the acrophase value as the p-value is greater than 0.05. The only significant value is the onset time, which is later in HD patients. I think this means when the melatonin starts to rise, but I'm not too sure. In the second study, the graph includes advanced HD patients, but the first study did not tell us whether the HD patients were early or advanced. The graph shows that HD patients also has a delayed melatonin peak, which occurs at 4 a.m. compared to 2 a.m. in the controls. But in contrast to the first study, the peak is lower in the patients compared to controls. So it's 80 picograms per mil rather than 100 picograms per mil in the controls. The table shows that the mean melatonin level and the amplitude is lower in advanced HD patients compared to the controls, and the ACK phase or peak occurs later. But there's no significant difference in the early or middle stage HD patients. The second question is, the authors reported that melatonin levels are decreased in Huntington's disease compared to controls. Is this a valid statement? Okay, so from the data presented, I don't think we can conclude that melatonin levels are definitely decreased in HD. For example, the mesol values, which is the mean levels, do not show a significant decrease in the second study in advanced HD patients compared to controls. And this is not reflected in early to mid-stage HD patients or in the first study, which shows an insignificant difference in the mean 24-hour levels of melatonin. We do not know how reliable the data is. For example, we're not told about how many patients were in each group or healthy controls. So we don't know if the sample size is too small to detect a significant difference or not. It's also difficult to compare between the studies. For example, the control mean melatonin levels in study one is 22.7, but in study two, it is more than double that at 47.8 picograms per mil. This makes it hard to draw any valid conclusions. Perhaps a better conclusion would be that there's like a delay in the peak melatonin levels at night in patients compared to controls, as both studies' graphs seem to suggest this. Okay, so data analysis stations can be quite daunting, but it's important to work through it logically. First, describe what the data is showing before trying to explain the results and compare between both the studies. Start by commenting on what each axis is saying and what the general trend is, as I did by saying that melatonin increases in the night and also say what groups were included in the study. It's good to back up what you're saying with specific data points, as I did when commenting on the peak melatonin levels. Once you've described the data, you can compare the differences between the two groups. Also, don't be afraid to criticize the data, including what the data has not told you. Use all your A-level science prowess by commenting on the reliability of the data and whether any significant associations are true 
or maybe due to confounding factors. And this is your typical correlation versus causation type argument. The mark scheme for the station would be something like gaining a few points for describing the data, identifying the general trends, and then making direct comparisons between the two sets of data by quoting specific values where appropriate. For the second question, be sure to critique the data and include what the data does not tell you. And finally, give a justification of why you think the author's conclusions are valid or not. Okay, that brings us to the end of the video. I hope you found it useful. If you want a mock interview with me, follow the link in the description box below, which will take you to a Google Doc where I explain more about what mock interviews I'm offering, like mock MMIs, mock Oxbridge Medicine interviews, and panel interviews. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this in the future. You might also want to check out like my other video where I share the 10 most common station themes which come up in MMIs every year. Anyway, take care. I wish you all the best for your interviews and bye for now.